Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship, where we all overdose on fellowship. Amen. We're going to get into the Word of God. We're going to go back, back into the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 3. As we've been going through the, the book of Hebrews, it's been good for me to re-up on diving in because it's such a relevant book for us. We know that the author of Hebrews is somewhat unknown because there isn't a signature on the document. And some people who believe it was Paul who wrote believe he didn't write his name because the Hebrews wouldn't read it because he was considered the apostle to the Gentiles. And there are folks who believe it was a, all sorts of other people, but we know who wrote the book of Hebrews and it's the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. So as we look at it, it is incredibly relevant for us. This letter that was to an early church, probably Jerusalem, and telling these Jewish folks who have come out of temple worship and all of the regulatoriness and the sacrificial system that Jesus is superior to everything that that was a shadow of Jesus is the fulfillment of. Amen? Amen. And so that's what we're going to see as we go through. And it's all the way through. There are these six warnings that we're going to find. And so as we go through, be sensitive because this book is for you. This message is for you. This chapter is for you. It's not just for me or for a bunch of people way back then. It's for us today. And so... Um, let's pray. Father, help us to take your word at your word, that we would take it as it is, that we might understand that you have a message for each one of us today. I thank you for the privilege and the honor of being able to be in your house today, a place that you have called for us to gather, to seek your face, to declare your worth, to investigate and to uncover who you are and who you are with us. So Lord, I pray that you guide us and that you help us so that we might be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Hebrews chapter three, we're given this, the second alarm here through the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse three is beware brethren. Notice it's brethren, so that's sisters as well. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. We call it backsliding. Uh, any of you ever backslid? Wonder. Any, any backslid? Okay. We're going to shoot for today is a little front sliding, <laughs> if that's okay with you. We're, we're called to be careful of what's going on in our heart, which tells me that we're not like we will be. When you got saved and you accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, you got delivered from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. One day when the Lord comes back, we'll really be saved and we will be delivered from the very presence of sin. But until that happens, I'm going to do what the scripture says and I'm going to mortify my flesh. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to live to the Lord. Amen? Amen? So that's what we're called to do. And it's not about me and it's not even about you. It's about him. That's what our lives are about. It's not about getting a job, making enough money, buying some stuff so that eventually you could retire and then die. Because what in the world is that all about? There's no purpose for being in that. And then you have to worry about the end which comes for all of us. And so until that comes, I want to make sure that I'm doing everything that the Lord would have me do. And I have a feeling that's your heart as well. So as we look at the scriptures, just to remind you where you are, shameless commercial plug. Previously at Grace, we looked in chapter one where we were looking at Jesus and how he is far better than the angels. And so we've gotten this comparison from the author the angels were reverenced by the Hebrews and, and they were basically right next to God. And Jesus is not an angel and he's so much further above an angel. And so we looked at that. And even though Muhammad Ali said he's the greatest, <laughs> Jesus is the greatest. In chapter two, we see that Jesus was made a little lower, that he became us. 
that he came from heaven and stepped down, became a man, and then rose victorious from the grave so that you and I might not worry about death because he conquered death for all of us. So we looked at that last week and how Jesus was there again compared to some angels, but he is descended below the angels because he became one of us. And yet because of that, he's elevated f even further, if you can imagine. And these are the six warnings that you find in the book of Hebrews. The first one was drifting. We have to be careful of drifting. The second one is doubting. So we don't, we want to be careful. And that's the one that we're going to hit today. I'm so glad you appreciate my little we do, we do. quirks. If we had sound, you would have heard bee boo, bee boo. So I have grandchildren. Maybe you don't. This week, we're going to be cautioned. We're going to say, beware against unbelief. And so we're going to talk about this. We talked about it at the men's retreat a little bit in a different context. But this, this morning, we're going to begin with verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, not just brethren, this is holy brethren now, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. So we were comparing Jesus to angels in chapter one. In chapter two, we saw he was comparing with man, and he stepped down below the angels and rose up above the angels. Now we're going to get a comparison to Moses. How's Jesus stack up with Moses? Whenever I see these comparisons, I always think of a fight, you know, so-and-so versus so-and-so. How's it going to, you know, who's going to win? And they're going to compare Moses, who is the most revered person in the Old Testament, according to the Hebrews, because he was the one who wrote the first five books. Not only that, but he also saw God. He wanted, he let me see your glory, Lord. And he hid them in the cleft of the rock and he went by. There was all this glory given to Moses and all of this responsibility. You know, the burning bush story. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Parting of the Red Sea. And miracles like water coming from a rock in a desert and quail coming in from all of the things that Moses administrated as a leader. So he's reverenced. And yet next to Jesus, it's like comparing a house and the architect of the house. Make sense? You guys are very quiet today. So who's he addressing? The author is addressing holy brethren. That's us, by the way. You might not feel like it, but that's who you are. How many of you feel like a saint? I feel like a saint because I believe this is what God calls me, which means a holy one. How many of you feel like sinners? Let me help you. <laughs> You're a saint who sins. You're not a sinner who, who does good things here and there. You're a saint because God called you one. Now, I'm not going to make a little effigy of you with a little bobblehead and put you on my dashboard, but you're a saint. It doesn't mean we don't sin, but we are not slaves to sin any longer. And God calls us saints. So either you're a saint or you ain't. <laughs> Heavenly calling. Those who have a heavenly calling, God has called out and cried out to each one of us. And at some point we had a, we had a response of, yes, I will follow you. The heavenly calling is to be reconciled to God because when we're born, we're at enmity with God. That means we're constantly fighting him, both the internal conscience and the external witness of his creation. We're always fighting against in our flesh, but at some point the Holy spirit wore you down chased you down and cornered you. And you said, I quit. I give up. It's kind of like drowning and knowing you're drowning. And God throws you a life vest and says, here, put this on. That's Jesus. And if you say, no, you drowned at your own peril. You reject him at your own peril. So this is our holy calling. So he's definitely talking to you and I consider the apostle it's interesting. It's the only place in the New Testament where Jesus is called an apostle. You, you thought there were just 12, right? 
except for Judas. But then there's Paul. And what about Matthias? Anyway, the apostle. An apostle is a sent out one. It's one who is a representative of someone else. You might know it as an ambassador. Like we have ambassadors all over the world, right? Before we go to war with people, you know what we do? We pull those people out of there. Shameless plug for the rapture. But the apostle and high priest. Jesus is called our high priest. And we're going to get into it when we talk about Melchizedek in the later chapters. He's our high priest. Now, you guys might be thinking of something from the Catholic Church, you know. How many, you know, you're probably thinking of a priest like that, but this is more in the line of a Jewish priest, which is different. And Jesus is called our high priest. He's not only the high priest who is an intercessor between man and God, but he is also the sacrifice. He's also the temple. He's also the holy of holies. He's also, I mean, you can go on and on. Every single thing in the Old Testament about that is a picture of who Jesus is. It's a shadow. So, our high priest. In 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 6, it says this. Paul writing to Timothy says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You know what that means? You can go right to Jesus. Now, some of you come from a Catholic background. You can't do that. There's a wholly different administration. You got to go to Bartholomew. You got to go to, you got to go to whoever the... Whoever the saint in charge of your bowel movements are, or you know, like you got to go to all these people. That's not in the Bible, by the way. It's not in the Bible. There's there's somebody to talk to about fertility. There's you know, I mean, uh, who needs all the commercials and medications? You just go to one of the saints. No, there is one mediator between man and God, and that's Jesus Christ. Which means I don't want you lining up at my door telling me your sins. Pastor Dave, I got to confess. Okay, well, you should talk to the Lord about that. Unless you need some counsel, I'd be glad to help you. But I am not going to give you absolution. And I, you know, you don't need my forgiveness. You need the forgiveness of God Almighty. Right? Everybody okay? They're my friends over there. One mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. You can go right to Jesus and say, Lord, I got a problem. And he's listening. You don't have to wait in line. You don't have to hope he answers the phone. He's there, right? And I'm glad for that. He is the apostle, the sent out one who represented someone else. And he is the high priest. He is the one who intercedes for us. And he did it with his very blood, superior to the Old Testament. And so we're told to consider Jesus. Consider it means to think about, mull over, meditate on. Think about Jesus compared to Moses. Moses was just a man, wasn't he? Yeah. We know he did some awesome things. We know that he made some serious mistakes too, right? And we know that Moses died and he wasn't resurrected, at least not yet. So Jesus and Moses are vastly different. But the Hebrews reverenced Moses to the point where some of these young believers wanted to go back to the sacrificial system, go back to the temple, go back to all of the rules and the regulations and the smells and bells and all that stuff. They missed it because it just seemed too simple. Accept God's free gift into your life and follow him and God will forgive you of your sins. That just seems like somebody's trying to sell me something. That's the truth though. And it's the best deal anybody will ever get. In John 6.32, it says, And then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. They were saying that since Moses came, and one of the proofs that Moses was from God is that he fed everybody. Manna from heaven. And Jesus corrected them, and he said, No, Moses didn't give you bread. My Father gave you bread. And by the way, I'm the bread. 
Jesus isn't just the high priest. He's not just the sacrifice. He's not just the temple. He's not just the holy of holies and the candlestick holder and the table of showbread. He also happens to be bread from heaven. He's bread from heaven. He's the real bread that if we eat, we will never die, he said. <coughs> so Jesus compared to Moses is a far different character than Moses was. Moses brought the law. You remember the first person to break the law? It was him. <laughs> he brought it down and, and that was the first copy because he's a man just like anybody else since he literally broke the law. And there was a whole bunch of death. And there were 5,000 people that got slain that day. Ooh. And then we see in second chapter of Acts, the birth of the church, there are 5,000 people that were born again that day. At the birth of the law, there were 5,000 who died. At the birth of the church, there were 5,000 who came to life. Jesus is far different than Moses. Moses was the one who brought them all the way to the edge of the desert but was never going to lead them into the promised land because Moses is a representative of the law and the law will never bring you into the promised land. Only Yeshua, only Joshua or Jesus will. Everything in the scriptures is intentional. And so Jesus has more honor like a house and a builder of a house have. These are some nice architectures, uh, architectural designs made by a man named Frank Lloyd Wright. You may have heard of him. He's a very famous, this is what he looks like in case you were wondering. Jesus is comparing, or I'm sorry, the scripture is comparing Jesus to Moses, just like an architect in a house. You look at a house and you say, wow, it's a great house. But you know what? It's, it's just a house and it'll get destroyed and you could build another one. If you're a master architect, especially one like Falling Water. It's uh, the, the one in the bottom left here is absolutely a, a wonder of uh, gravitational um, anomaly. It looks like it's just floating, but it's because it's the way it's put together. And so the comparison is made between Moses and Jesus, just like a house and an architect. The one who built the house is, has more worthy, is worthy of more honor than the house itself which is calling Jesus the builder of the house. What house is he talking about? He's talking about everything. And so Jesus is a builder of the house, but what did he build? Everything, everything that's seen and everything that's unseen, anything that is, any, anything that has matter and time, Jesus created it. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. By the way, they're, they're not just physical governing authorities. These are also spiritual governing authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So he definitely is the architect just because he's got a hard hat on. He's also called the son Christ is a son and not a servant. Moses was a servant in God's house. Jesus is the son. It's a far different thing than a servant of the house is the son. So, and it says whose house we are. Isn't it interesting? Have you ever thought of yourself as God's house? I always thought we come into church, we come into the house of God. I know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, but the body of Christ is the house of God whose house we are, it says in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. The word is poema. It means we're his poem. Kind of interesting. <laughs> Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God pre prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God prepared good things for us to do, not to win our salvation, but to be a demonstration of our salvation. Make sense? The very fact that I can do good things now and I'm, I don't have to be attached to it. I can do secret things. I can slip people money. I can do all sorts of good things and nobody will ever know. God knows. I don't do them so that God sees. And it's like, you love me more now, right? I do that because God already loves me more. 
In fact, he can't love me anymore. And so that motivates us as opposed to trying to get God's favor. Whose house we are if, notice this contingent clause, the dreaded if. If you ever see in a contract, you should take notice. Whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Now think about who he's speaking to. <coughs> Hebrew Christians. Some of them thinking about going back, leaving the worship and leaving, quite honestly, the persecution that comes with being a Christian in the first century. Also, you wouldn't be able to do business with all the people you used to do business with because they would shun you like you were dead. You're dead to me. That's what they would do with Christians. So it's a whole lot easier in a first century church to go back to that system because it's comfortable. And yet you'd have to turn your back on Jesus Christ, wouldn't you? And you're going back to a system that is only a shadow of who Jesus is the reality. I don't know if you've ever heard, um, I don't know if you've ever heard this poem. It's actually a writing. Any of you aware of if it's called if Runyard Kipling wrote it. It's an, it's an interesting thing to go through. I think it has a lot of good Christian principle. I'm not going to read it through because I'd have to make it bigger print. But it's uh, if. If you can do this, then. If, then. And there's all these ifs and thens. And it's, uh, it was an encouragement to me to read through it. It's about being a man, actually, and being mature. Uh, so if you, you want to pick that up by Runyon Kipling, you can do that. But here, we are God's house if... We hold fast. It sounds very conditional, like, well, what if I don't hold fast my confession? What if I don't rejoice? What if I don't have my hope firm? Does that mean I'm not God's house anymore? Very quiet here today. I have good news for you. That is not the case. Matthew 24, Jesus speaking about the end times and uh, the tribulation, he says here in Matthew 24, 11 to 14, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. And then the end will come. Jesus says the one who endures to the end will be saved. Does that condition you to endure to the end or you're not saved? Or is it, if you're truly saved, you will endure to the end? You see, the very proof that you can endure to the end shows that it's not about you. It's about the grace of God and the spirit of God, which was put inside of you, causing you to will and to do for his good pleasure. If you have that ever ready battery, the Holy Spirit, you will endure to the end. But if we fall short in the middle, does it make you scratch your head? How many of you have ever doubted your salvation? You know, doubting your salvation is a good thing. What do you mean? I mean, it's a good thing. It's not a good place to stay. It's a good place to see in your rear view mirror. Because that means that there are issues that you have to work out about who God is and what he's done for you. And in working all those things out, we come down on the side of truth and we're like, okay, I get it. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you. And because it has everything to do with you, I have what it takes to endure to the end. And whatever difficulty it is that you're going through right now or have ever gone through is a temporary. It's not a permanent location. Don't make a change of address. It's only temporary. So what does it mean? It means let's get a grip here, boys and girls. Let's take this warning seriously. We're called to be careful about our hearts and about where our hearts go. And we are ones who are destined to rule to the end and overcome, not ones who will fall to the wayside. So 
I got to say stuff to my soul. Like, come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your voice. I have to talk to myself that way. Do you? I, I talk to myself all the time. I get temptation and I go, nope. Nope, not going to do that. Or I'm looking on my phone and some kind of crazy commercial comes up in my face. Nope. I say nope all the time. I'll tell you what, nope is a good thing. Is that a Jersey thing or is it just an ignorant thing? Nope. Nope. Jesus didn't save me for that. Bye. So you know what? We need to get a grip and we need to hold fast to these things, to our confidence and our hope and our joy. It is something that we are told to hold on to. Oh, too many stories, Pastor Dave. Just go. <laughs> Verse 7. Here we go. Verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, by the way, the scripture says that the Holy Spirit says this. What book is it in? I'm sorry. That's for the scholar. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. How many of you get scared when you read verses like that? I get a little scared, I get a little like, oh. The point is, this. It's, it's in the book of Psalms. Bottom line is this. The people of Israel, God's chosen people, weren't they? God took them out of bondage, didn't he? He sent them Moses. Tremendous. Went across the Red Sea. They saw miracle after miracle. They saw a giant pillar of light at night lit up their camp. They saw a giant pillar of of, of smoke in the daytime and it moved and it was the presence of God. And they said, I guess we'd better go. And they followed the presence of God wherever it is that they went. They saw miracle after miracle, after miracle, after miracle. They get into the promised land and they start complaining. Oh, Egypt was so much better. The cuisine. I mean, Remember we used to eat onions? It seems like a strange thing to be yearning for. Actually, they complained that they didn't have enough steak later on. And the Lord brought them so much they were knee deep in quail. Without a refrigerator. Until it came out of their nostrils. That's what the Lord said. So, the Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. By the way, did you know you can harden your heart? Ever had an argument with somebody and not forgive them for a while? Oh, not you good people. Good. I get in arguments with my wife still. And she will say something that hurts my feelings. And I will be silent. But I'll tell you what, the wheels are turning. And sometimes it takes me a while to put that fire out. Do you know what I'm talking about? People, do you know what I'm talking about? I need, I need a witness here. I need somebody to confess because I'm not going to be the only one up here confessing. You know what it's like to harden your heart? You harden your heart and you say, no, I'm not going to forgive you. Oh, <gasps> If those words come out of your mouth, your heart should jump. <laughs> Mine does. The Spirit of God goes, hey, hey. I forgave you all the stuff you did. This is a small thing. Okay, 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 okay. Then I tell her, give me time. And I walk away. Because sometimes you got to wait until your emotions cool off because you can't see anything. You can't see anything straight. You have the ability to harden your heart. You also have the ability to confess and to repent, to ask for forgiveness. You control that. If you're still angry and bitter at somebody, don't you blame God or somebody else. 
Well, the only reason I'm still mad, it's her fault. She didn't come and say, I'm sorry. Or some other kind of lame excuse. Do not harden your heart. If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. You know, God, when he speaks to your, when he speaks to your heart, I, I believe that there is a point, even in a believer's life, where he stops talking. He's like, cut it out, cut it out, cut it out. Okay, I'll wait. And I think the Lord waits until you fall down on your face and you cry out to him. And he goes, okay, let's start over. He doesn't say, I told you. Because he's not like your earthly father or maybe someone else you know. Do not harden your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, this is for you and I. Do not harden your heart. If God speaks to your heart, if you hear the Holy Spirit speak, don't harden your heart. You know who I think did? Ananias and Sapphira. If you like being slain in the spirit, that's cool. But not like that. They dropped dead. Dragged outside and buried. And it was an inspiration to the first century church. I I don't want to see that happen here. I don't want it to happen to me, first of all. Dave, if you hear the Holy Spirit speak, just don't harden your heart. Listen, I have to speak these words to myself before I ever teach them to you. Don't harden your heart. Because this has been your track record, you Hebrews. (laughs) This has been your track record, is to harden your heart after all these things. Proverbs 4.23, I'm doing this in the New English translation because it says it nicely. Guard your heart with all vigilance, For from it are the sources of life. You realize what you let into your heart is going to control your decisions, what you talk about, where you go, how you spend your money, how you react, what you allow into your heart. That's why when I'm looking at my phone, it's nope, nope, nope. Because I don't harden my heart to the voice of the Spirit of God, but I will harden my heart all day long to temptation. Amen? Amen. That's what we're called to do. The sin of unbelief. Did you know not believing something that God said is a sin? Well, it, it, it's more of a guideline. No, it's a sin. It's a sin to be disbelieving. In the men's retreat, we talked about the story of the 12 spies. 12 spies in chapter numbers 13 and 14. Moses gets into the land They're getting ready to set up. And he says, I'm going to send you guys into the promised land where God has promised. And he said, he's already given it to us. I'm going to send you guys in. And what I want you to do is look around, find the people that are there and look at the establishment, see if there's well-fortified cities, see if there are forests. He has them check all these things out and they come back and they say, oh yeah, we went where you said, oh yeah, it's a great place. Look, we've got all these grapes and they've got a whole bunch of grapes from the Valley of Eshkol and they bring it on a stick with two guys carrying it. You know, it's got to be big. And we also have some pomegranates and some figs. Oh yeah, it's a good land. But the people are huge and they're everywhere. They're on the, the Philistines are on the coast. We got uh, all these people everywhere. And we saw the sons of Anak there. Giants. There's giants in the land. And all of Israel got afraid. And it says they wept all night. (laughs) Because they believed the 10 spies that came back and gave the evil report. Caleb in the middle of it stopped him. Said, hey, let's go right now. Let's take the land. We can do it. Joshua and Caleb were the only ones who stood up. And because Israel accepted that. They said, let's get rid of Moses and Aaron. We'll find another leader. We'll go back to Egypt. And they got ready to stone Caleb and Joshua. Sometimes your own people will turn against you if you're going to live a life of faith. And guess what? The Lord shows up. (laughs) He interrupts the whole thing. Because God's got your back when you stand up for him. Anyway, 
the 12 spies did not believe that they could do what God said they could do. That's the sin of unbelief. Be careful you do not harden your heart. So this is our second warning about doubting. Be careful of an evil heart of unbelief. As a Christian, I'm going to ask a very sensitive question. As a Christian, how many of you have devised an evil thought against someone? I'm wondering. Okay. 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 I'm going to get them. They will never, ever say that about me again. Never. You can get an evil heart. You can have an evil intention. You can make an evil plan. And yet, I don't think you're a sinner, like habitual, like enslaved to it anymore. I think you're a saint, but you're a saint who sins. You're not a sinner who sometimes does good things. Be careful. People cut you off. I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. I'm a Jersey driver. I'm aggressive. And I don't, I don't like cutting people off, and I don't like when they cut me off. I got worse things, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Be careful of an evil heart of unbelief. Unbelief. Not believing what God plainly says. Well, the, the Bible can't possibly mean that. Beware of an evil heart of unbelief. If God says it, it's true. And if there's a disparity between you and his word, it's you who needs to change. If there's a disparity between me and his word, it's me who needs to change. Unbelief leads to departing. Notice, an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. And he's speaking to the Hebrews about leaving the Christian setting and going back to that setting of sacrificial system. You will depart from the place where God has called you to and God is working. You're going to depart from Jesus when you do that. And then there's a whole bunch of really crazy things that have to happen in your mind and heart when you go back. Any of you who backslid into something else, you know what it's like. You know the mental gymnastics you have to do to kind of keep on fighting against the rubber band of the Holy Spirit who's pulling you back. Any of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I'm going to be mad. I'm going to, I'm going to go and do something stupid. Oh, it's so hard to go back. And then you repent and you come back and it's like the Lord just snaps you up in his arms and it's wonderful. But be careful because a lot of damage can be done while you're pulling at that rubber band. Damage that will affect you for all of your life. I know a man who hardened his heart and walked away from God. And he had a one night stand and impregnated a woman. And she had a child. And he said, well, I guess I need to do the right thing before God and live with her for the rest of my life. And he did. And it was miserable. He wouldn't marry her, which was miserable for her, miserable for the child, miserable for him, miserable for everybody. You want to talk about messing up your life. You can struggle against that rubber band and really do some serious damage. That's why the scripture tells us be careful because it leads to going away and departing from the living God. Second Corinthians 13, five says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith, test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified you see, that's why I say testing is good. Questions are good. That's difficulty. But I'll tell you what, you don't want to stay there. You want to look in the rearview mirror at it, right? Lord, I don't know if I'm really a Christian. Am I really a Christian? Did, it, did you really save me? Did I say the right words? Did I do the right thing? Did I, you know, it's good to sort through that. And the scripture says we should examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. But you know what? You don't, you don't live in that. Who wants to live in that? I'd rather boil in oil. In Galatians 6, 3 and 4 says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. 
You see, when you ask people, say, hey, listen, are you a, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Well, yeah, I believe he's a historical figure that came and lived. And that's a different thing. Do you have a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ? Oh, uh, well, I'm a good person. I try to do good things. I'm better than this guy. This guy's terrible. It's not about anybody else. God doesn't grade on a curve. It's either you've been forgiven and Jesus Christ is the head of your life or not. And we should examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. If you say, I'm a lemon tree and there's no fruit, how do I know you're telling the truth? Or if you tell me you're a lemon tree and you got car parts hanging on you, I got to say, that can't be. Car parts don't come from trees. If so, I would have planted one. It says that we're to exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see, again, we're given the warning and we're given the antidote, which is encouragement or exhortation. The word for exhortation, I have it there in Greek for my Greek friends, parakaleo. Everybody say parakaleo. Parakaleo. We're speaking in tongues here today. Parakaleo. You'll notice paraclete is the root, which is the Holy Spirit. That's the word for the Holy Spirit, by the way, the one who comes alongside, the comforter, the counselor, God himself in the form of the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. And so we're supposed to be like little Holy Spirits, if I could be so irreverent, and come along and encourage one another, exhort one another, right? Yes. Which means having at my heart a deep conviction for your best good, which is my definition for love. That's the antidote to that locked up heart is loving on somebody, exhorting somebody, using your words, using your finances, using your back. If they need something moved, whatever it is, exhort them, encourage them, lift them up, come alongside them, which is why we're here, right? Which is why we don't neglect the meeting of the assembly of the brethren as some are in the habit of doing. But all the more as we see the day approach, we come together to exhort one another, encourage one another. We worship together. We worship the Lord together. And we listen to the, we listen to the scriptures and what he teaches us. That's the antidote to somebody whose heart is going away. And you can't do that if you don't have interaction, right? We exhort one another. It is clearly the duty of every believer to examine, maintain, and guard your own heart against unbelief. It, it is then when we must exhort others wisely on a daily basis because sin is deceitful. You ever try to talk somebody out of doing something stupid that they're just dead set to do it? They're deceived. You got to pray that the Lord help you and that the spirit of God break through that stupor. Question, verse 16 talking about the people of Israel and how they wandered off and how they were rebellious. Who, for who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he angry with for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he, they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? And so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They weren't able to go to the promised land because they didn't believe God. So if we see that in us, that should shake us up. Right? Israel was on the right side of the Red Sea, but the wrong side of the Jordan. Not slaves, but not free yet. I think that's a statement that's true of some people. I think they may have accepted Jesus Christ as their savior and they're having a little trouble making him Lord, making him the boss. And in some respect, all of us will be living out that reality all of our lives, sanctifying ourselves, repenting, apologizing, asking for forgiveness and moving on in Christ and maturing. That's the sign of being a Christian is your always getting better. You might 
You might take two steps forward and one step back, but you're on that road and doing the things that the Lord would have you do. Always constant progression. Israel was led by Moses for 40 years, but did not enter the promised land. He was a good leader, but they were unbelieving people. You could say, well, Moses was flawed. That's why the people didn't listen. No, they didn't listen because they're personally accountable before God. Moses did a pretty good job. He did some things I could never do. I'm not sure I'd make a better job. I'd get super impatient with people too. But I don't carry a rod for that reason. So, Israel was led by Moses and he was a great leader, but they never entered the promised land because they rebelled and they didn't believe. God consistently was revealing himself to them by many miraculous means, but their heart was hard. Miracles don't produce faith. You know that? Lord, I would, I would believe you if, if you wrote it in the sky, I would believe you. Or Lord, if you just make this happen, if I get this job or I'm making $890,000 a year, I will, I will tithe. I will do everything for you. I'll be good. I'll give it to charity. I'll think about being nice to people. I'll... You're asking for a miracle and saying it's going to produce faith. If you're not going to be obedient because the Lord told you to do it, then there's nothing going to persuade you. Be careful of your heart. It is the wellspring of life. And remember the beginning of the chapter was consider Jesus. Jesus was faithful in all of God's house. Moses was a good servant, but Jesus is the son. So we think about him. Chapter four, very quickly. Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear. Let us fear. Lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. We're going to talk about this next week. But I want you to consider this. There were people in the Twin Towers on September 1st. The first plane hit. And people were told to go back to work. They were in the other building looking out the window. And bosses said, go back to work. They went back to work and the second plane hit. I know people that were there that lost their lives. You probably do too. I know somebody who left. They saw that happen and they said, I'm out of here. <laughs> Grabbed the elevator while it was still available and went down. And as they were walking away from the building, the second plane came and hit. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a mandate in scripture to be careful. Be careful of what's going on with your heart and make sure you respond when God speaks to your heart. Because if you don't, you have absolutely no idea what the next thing is that might happen. And we just absolutely have to listen because it will be to our detriment. And we're going to talk about faith and works and how that works together. And we're going to pick that up next week. So I want to thank you guys. You thought I was going to do a whole chapter. You're out of your mind. I'm going to wear you people out. Be careful of your heart. Be careful what you set your affections on. Be careful of what you make a priority in your life. Be careful of what you do with this so precious a salvation that God has given to us because we can waste it and fritter it away, which we don't want to do. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. The scripture is incredibly rich and is for us. We have an opportunity to respond to it in faith and I can tell you there are always blessings that come with that. Amen? Amen? But being obedient to what God tells us to do, even when it's hard, there's always a blessing along with it. And so I would encourage you, just whatever it is that the Lord spoke to you here today, do it. 
Don't harden your heart.